Hello, everybody. Um, uh, welcome uh, to the Jackson School at the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, I'm Leela Fernandez, director of the school. Um, I would like to begin by um, uh, saying that um, at the Jackson School, we acknowledge that we are on Coast Salish territory, the traditional homelands of the, of the Duwamish, Sequamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations and other native peoples. The Jackson School understands that the international community includes sovereign American Indian tribes, indigenous nations, and people across the world. Um, thank you for joining us today. This is the uh, first event in a very exciting series called Protest, Race, and Citizenship Across African Worlds. I'd just like to say, spend a few minutes talking about why the ser series is so important to the Jackson School. Um, here at the Jackson School, we are working very hard on thinking about how to address our own institutional responsibilities um, in, in addressing um, the complex inequalities which we all deal with and live with, including race, gender, sexuality, um, amongst many other um, dimensions. And um, the, the purpose of this series is, is to both um, mark the intellectual dimensions of that investment um, and also to think very creatively and to acknowledge how emerging scholarship is really helping us rethink how we imagine the world and to rethink um, all, uh, rethink more conventional definitions of area studies so that Africa um, is a territorial continent, but it is also a complex um, mobile um, set of identities, movements, experiences, migrations. And, um, and we have a very rich um, uh, speaker series, which is trying to give a sense of that, um, just the wonderful work which is coming out from emerging scholars. And so I hope that um, this, uh, you will join us for, for many of these events. Um, I'd like to just begin by thanking um, the Center for African Studies, who really um, um, has really done um, the substance of this work, um, in particular, Monica Rojas, for all of the um, hard work she has done in, in, her, in organizing this. And, uh, and my colleague, Dan, Danny Hoffman, who has just been incredibly wonderful and who's really, the, in many ways, the intellectual um, inspiration um, behind this, this series. And I'm, I'm very lucky to have him as a colleague uh, in the Jackson School. Um, and then finally, I'd like to say, you know, I'm relatively new to the University of Washington and um, working on this, these issues is a much wider collaborative um, project. And I think you'll see that reflected in the series because we'll have many people, many of our partner units um, participating substantively and intellectually. But I would also like to formally thank all our uh, co-sponsors for this um, series, in particular, the Center for Global Studies, the Comparative History of Ideas, Near Eastern Languages and Civilization, the Simpson Center for the Humanities, the Henry M. Jackson Foundation and the Gender and Gender Women's and Sexuality Studies. Um, and so, on that note, let me um, introduce um, my colleague in women in, in uh, Gender Women's and Sexuality Studies, Amanda Swar, um, who will um, both introduce our speaker for today and then also come back on as discussant uh, for the for the speaker to jumpstart uh, um, the discussion which we'll have today. So, Amanda Swar is an associate professor of Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies. Her work is concerned with queer, trans, and intersex studies, medical inequalities, and feminist politics in South Africa and the US. Professor Swar is the author of Sex and Transition, Remaking Gender and Race in South Africa, which was awarded the Sylvia Rivera Prize in Transgender Studies, honorable mention for the Ruth Benedict Prize from the Association for Queer Anthropology, and honorable mention for the 2014 Distinguished Book Award from the American Sociological Association's Section on Sexuality. She is also the co-editor of Critical Feminist Transnational Praxis. And Amanda, I used to teach this book every year in, in my courses when I was were teaching in prior universities. It's an anthology engaged with North-South feminist collaborations and power through the lens of praxis, the juncture of theory and practice. Suar's current book project, Envisioning African Intersex, Challenging Medicine, Racism, and Gender Impositions in South Africa, explores how colonialism and scientific racism are integral to intersex medicine, focusing on South African intersex activists' challenges to dominant representations and violence. Thank you, Amanda, for being here with us today. Thanks so much, Leela. Um, we are really excited to begin this start uh, series and to welcome you to this virtual talk entitled, Whose Struggle for What? Sexual Minorities and Social Movements in Africa with Dr. Sterowit Debele. Dr. Debele holds a master's degree in indigenous cultural studies from Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. 
and a doctorate in religious studies from the University of Beirut in Germany. Among other positions, she's been honored as postdoctoral research fellow and guest researcher at Max Planck Institute for the Study of Religious and Ethnic Diversity in Göttingen. She is currently a junior research group leader in the Africa Multiple Cluster of Excellence at the University of Beirut, where she leads a team of doctoral researchers in the project Sexualities, Political Orders, and Revolutions in Africa. Dr. Debelli's scholarship is extensive and with wide impact. She has published articles in prestigious journals that span geographic locations and disciplines, including religious studies, migration and asylum studies, African history, and gender and sexuality studies. Her monograph titled Locating Politics in Ethiopia's Eritrea Ritual was published in 2019 and adeptly demonstrates how indigenous annual ritual performances are integral to Ethiopian politics. Her most recent publications rethink how the imperial state governed the intimate lives of subjects and how this governance continues to today. She demonstrates that reliance on select stories and ancient documents inform century old threads of legal discrimination, while parallel stories from Ethiopian history allow activists to reframe their own belonging in the present. These interventions form groundwork for a new manuscript tentatively titled The Desire for History, Queering Troubling Ethiopia's Historiography, which is very eagerly anticipated, including by me, I can't wait to read it. Dr. Debele is part of a new generation of scholars focused on protest politics who bring innovative insights to African history while also engaging in global conversations with deep influence. Her work importantly highlights the marginalized position of Ethiopia in African studies, but this work is not simply filling in the gaps that have stemmed from exclusion. Instead, Dr. Debele's scholarship challenges us to re-theorize concepts as broad as empire, identity, and reproduction in ways that are grounded in archival and ethnographic work yet are useful to those in any discipline and indeed for non-academic audiences. This is also really important work. These fresh and generalizable perspectives put Dr. Debele at the cutting edge of global debates about the consequences of history in the present. They help us think about strategies and possibilities for social change now. We are honored to have Dr. Debele to share some of her work in progress with us today. So please join me in welcoming her virtually to the University of Washington. Um, hi, so, uh, yeah, um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on the time zone in which um, uh, you are located. And uh, Amanda, thank you very, very much for a really generous uh, introduction. Uh, and I'm humbled uh, to be here and um, be able to share my, my thoughts, some of my, you know, preliminary thoughts about what I intend um, to do, I'll quickly share my screen um, before I move on to the talk. Okay. <laughs> so in this presentation, uh, I reflect on the potentials of delving into moments of political transformation by centering queer subjects. I ask, do queer people seize this moment to imagine alternatives, for example, to cultivate a better world? And if so, how are these moments imagined or experienced by those whose political subjectivities are written off by hegemonic discourses and violent actions across space and time? And what theoretical implications does asking these questions have, for example, on the interaction of African studies and sexuality as an epistemic category. The talk is divided into three parts. In the first, I will lay out the questions um, I have been grappling with in the past few months. In the second, I offer a brief methodological reflection on how I think the question can be approached. In the final, I share my thoughts about the interaction of African studies or broadly area studies with the study of sexualities. 
So um, uh, quickly, before I go to the main uh, part of my presentation, um, I'd like to say um, what I'm doing here is share uh, some uh, conceptual um, thoughts have, have, uh, in mind and while listening to me, I don't have a lot of um, empirical material. So while listening to me, imagine I'm, I'm sharing some a project proposal or a project idea for a research um, I am embarking on really very soon. Within the last 10, 15 years, Africans from East to West and North to, to South took to the streets to demand change that in turn introduced major political transformations. These moments of change are exciting sites to ask new questions or rethink older assumptions about queer subjectivities within the context of popular uprisings. Aspiring to do both, my talk interrogates how queer people feature and how they imagine or experience such moments of rupture that challenge the roots of authoritarianism. Perhaps it's obvious that popular uprisings host plural, although mostly overlapping imaginations embodied by actors from across the board. Despite the plurality of actors and visions, one group whose perspective ha perspectives has received less attention in such political contexts is that of queer subjects. The way in which these revolutionary moments are imagined, engaged and experienced by queer persons is what I intend to dwell on um, in my four years project. For reasons I will explain later in the talk, my thinking is inspired by what sparked in Tunisia, Ethiopia and Sudan. In 2011, Tunisians took to the streets demanding change. It extended to other parts of North Africa and the Middle East in what was later dubbed as Arab Spring. The Oromo protest of 2014-16 in Ethiopia led to a political transformation in 2018, um, a development of great significance in shaping the course of events in the Horn region of Africa. In 2018-19, Sudanese popular protests led to the removal of Omar al-Bashir, al who had been in power for about three decades. Now, if akin to Walter Benjamin, such moments blast out of the continuum of the historic process to interrupt orderly flow of things political, they have indeed disrupted continuities in authoritarian grip on power. Just as they were disruptive fragments of, for the oppressors, there are moments of hope, rich with possibilities for the oppressed to shake the roots of their longstanding subordination. With this in mind, it's worth asking what, what emancipatory possibilities these historic moments might have generated for sexual minorities and thereby explore methodological and theoretical insights that can be gained from asking such questions. The spur to follow up on what these moments um, look like when engaged by sexual minorities came from ongoing conversations with my interlocutors in Ethiopia and in the diaspora. My previous research on the Oromo protest and my ongoing project on queer Ethiopians were affirmative of the fact that revolutions are points of intersection for the, for the fight against all forms of inequalities by plurality of actors. Ethiopian queer people mobilized different mediums such as artistic and literary productions. Fine art and literary productions get used to reify hegemonic knowledges and norms. They also get deployed for imagining subversions of and alternatives to the heteronormativity of Ethiopian politics. Sexual minorities became more visible both during and after the 2011 revolution. And not so long ago in 2018, we read the news that an openly gay Tunisian man who goes by the name Munir Batur announced his interest to run for presidency. Similarly, in Sudan, underground activism started questioning the role and place of queer subjects in the ongoing political struggle. In July 2020, we read that Sudan removed the death penalty and flogging as punishment for same-sex desires. The events in these countries revealed that queer people are active members of their societies 
who immerse themselves into the struggle for socio-political change. Needless to say, some of the aspirations might be specific to the conditions of sexual minorities, while others are part of the general demand for socioeconomic betterment of societies. Whether or not the aftermath of the revolutions brought about the desired change, these moments were crucial in and of themselves as sites of emancipatory imaginations for queer subjectivities. However, in the literature and popular perceptions, the struggle of non-normative sexual communities is regarded as a non-issue in revolutionary moments as far as mainstream political struggles are concerned. This is informed by the assumption that non-heterosexual groups and their quests are foreign, compartmentalized, outward looking and not grounded in broader questions for um, social justice. There's also a belief that theirs is an agenda left or even worse, an agenda that should be left to international NGOs and Western oriented liberal human right, rights activists. But besides depoliticizing the group, this view uproots non-heterosexuals from local histories and political struggles. Furthermore, most of what's studied about revolutions privileges the cause, the questions asked by the dominant actors and the aftermath of such uprisings. Now, putting aside the teleological position that revolution has to lead to some kind of destiny in human progress, I approach revolutions to focus on the plurality of visions and experiences it generates and how the very moment transforms one's relationship to the self as well as to others. This approach draws on the Iranian scholar, scholar Beruz Gamari Tabrizi, who writes on the revolution, on the 1979 revolution. But above all, my talk to focus on the value of the moment is inspired by the following statement by a Sudanese um, female queer person. Reflecting retrospectively, Jaha says, I quote, it's not just that I had hope. I was living through mirac a miracle. I had the guts to claim a life that was once a dream. What came into reality was existing without, within loving and rebellious communities. Increased freedom of mobility and autonomy, expanded space of influence and voicing collective demands, effortless fluidity of sexuality and attraction. There were no contradictions, no either or no binaries. End of quote. What we gather from Jaha's sentiment is how much the moment meant, irrespective of what became of it later on. In fact, the nostalgia that abounds the quote is a reminder that the moment is worth dwelling on for many people. No matter how fleeting it was for Jaha and her compatriots, it was a sight of asserting their significance by being part of history in the making. Jaha and her friends, in the words of Ashil and Bimbe, I quote, produce their humanity in the face of powerful, dehumanizing, and at times abstract and invisible forces, end of quote. A similar sentiment is expressed in the most recent uprising in Nigeria, which was dubbed as end SARS on social media. This was a protest demanding to disband SARS, the special anti-robbery squad, and thereby end police brutality. Showing their solidarity, my Ethiopian queer friend Faris Kuchi Kazahen said, it's such a proud and historic moment for queer siblings standing for themselves and intersectional inclusion. Faris praised the moment for what it signifies in terms of writing queer persons as historical subjects or as makers of history. Now, to investigate lived experience of queer subjects in this political context necessarily demands a reconceptualization of the group as a political society after Adam Brandt and Zakaria Mampili, who live in a who live a precarious life that's dictated by a distinct relation with the state, the society, and global forces. It also means that we are taking these struggles for their struggles for acceptance, dignity, decriminalization, and socioeconomic justice 
as part and parcel of other popular uprisings that demand change. The uprisings have to also be conceptualized as critical events per Wiener does. As Das highlights, critical events offer modalities for political action by which different communities construct themselves as political actors. Critical events thus allow otherwise depoliticized subjects such as women, children, and non-normative sexual groups to become politicized and take center stage in history or in history making. Now this said, let me move um, to the methodological reflections. The research is largely ethnographic, focusing on queer people's experiences in and of the revolutionary moment in three countries, Tunisia, Ethiopia, and Sudan. We generate materials through extended conversations, life histories, debates, group discussions, hangouts, etc. Given that we work with people who live under, uh, who live and operate under subterranean currents, the way in which we connect with our interlocutors depends on our previous networks and newly emer emerging connections. From my research in Ethiopia, it was clear to me that ethnography is an ongoing process which begins by being initiated into membership, into a queer kinship, otherwise known as family by choice. Once the researcher is welcome to the family, the exchanges are both intersubjective and intimate, situated and embodied with a level of trust and comfort to be vulnerable around each other. The interlocutors engage, debate on issues, develop arguments, challenge the researcher's preconceptions and cultivate productive conversations, making the research ra rather interactional um, no, than uh, extractive. Knowledge product production is made into a collective project where research participants are actively involved throughout the research process. This means that the field is not a pre-existing place or condition to go find informants and collect data, but it is one that's built together, of course, without disregarding the underlying power dynamics that inform such relationships. At the heart of my methodological approach is the resistance to the idea of objectivity and the dichotomy between the researcher as a knowing subject and the researched as a one to be examined. Although the research is uh, largely ethnographic, the project also depends on insights and tools from various other disciplines, such as history, literature, media, gender, cultural studies, to mention but a few, to access fragments of lived experiences. One might ask why I choose to focus on the three countries. Here's my thought. As far as both public imaginations and scholarly representations are concerned, Ethiopia, Tunisia, and Sudan are located in Africa without necessarily identifying with a continent. This is an orientalist legacy of a discursive construct that expands civilization from Africa by presenting a chunk of the continent as emphatically different, as in less savage and primitive, and hence belonging to the Orient. The three countries perceived exceptionalism feeds on the, this discourse where Ethiopia is depicted as a Christian, while Sudan and Tunisia belong to the Islamic Orient. If taken for granted, um, this overemphasis on narratives of exceptionalism conceals sites and potentials of relationships built through shared histories. What happens, for example, one might ask, or one should ask, what happens to shared social, cultural, and religious traditions, histories of liberation struggles, of colonial experiences, of contemporary political processes, if we simply emphasize difference as the only trope. As has been suggested by Mark Eppricht, the study of sexualities is a great entry point to forego, I quote, artificial borders and academic or linguistic silos created by different colonial slash national conventions. Transnational historical research on sexuality could in that way offer insights into hidden struggles 
tensions and connections and of course and of course while doing this we don't dismiss um differences and specificities um that exists within the regions now situating this study within revolutions as have been experienced across the continent enables us appreciate the emergence of queer sub queer people as a political subject. And lastly, focusing on the three countries affords us yet another way to interrogate an African studies that has been, that has mostly been preoccupied with Africa, south of the Sahara. Um, now this leads me to the last part of the talk. So, how do we imagine multiple ways of being African in a way that accommodates bodies beyond the heterosexual? How can African studies tran transcend its rendition as a depository of raw data, a field none or even anti-theoretical to quote Wendell Marsh? How do we go past the reduction of it, its our African intellectuals to mere native informants whose work does not go past offering empirical account on the basis of which others theorize. I submit these are questions of scholarly and political necessity, which we can at least partly address, one, through theorizing from the emerging materials instead of burying accounts under a premeditated theory, two, by attending to African modes of self-writing, and three, by rethinking epistemological categories such as sexuality and their applications and implications. Now, a great deal of my thoughts in this section is inspired by Achille Mbembe's two pieces, namely African Modes of Self-Writing and Africa in Theory, published in 2002 and 17 respectively. In Africa in Theory, Mbembe says, you know, pay, pays tri tribute to Africa as, I quote, the purveyor of some of the most compelling concepts without which the face of modern criticism would be utterly poor, end of quote. But paradoxically, as Mbembe notes, I quote, things African are regarded as residual entities, the study of which does not contribute anything to the knowledge of the world, or of the human condition in general, end of quote. This has reduced Africa, as is the case with other non-Euro-American contexts, to what he calls kingdom of ethnography, from where data are extracted to experiment with theories developed within the context of Western histories and experiences. Different regions in the global south are investigated as cases to test, I quote Maya, Makdashi and Jasbir Poir, epistemological and theoretical frameworks generated from the archives of the global norms, archives that cannot be divorced from imperial histories and archives of colonialism that cannot be read away from strategies of domination and extraction. End of quote. This has been the conundrum underlying the intersection of area studies and any received theory, whereby area studies gives raw data to try these theories. But since theory is also a form of political intervention with consequences, it means that any received theory with its transhistorical, secular, and universalistic undertones has implications on the life of those studied. Sexuality as an epistemic category in relation to African studies is a textbook example. For instance, the dehumanization and criminalization of African queer people is partly attributable to the unexamined both history and context-wise usage of the categories like homo and heterosexuality. One of the main explanations given by um, politicians and religious leaders is that non-heteronormative desire is simply an African. An African as in not. It is a Western colonial import and withdrawal of protection for sexual minorities is thus justified by articulating non-normative desire as a form of cultural imperialism against which Africans have to push back. This in turn results the notion of homophobia as the only truth about Africa, a notion that simply disregards complex histories of sexual desire. 
Okay. If we hidden Bembe's deliberations in both pieces I started with, he forces us to think our way out of this entrapment. Reconfiguring modes of African self-writing entails the need to admit that the world can be studied and theorized from everywhere and anywhere. It also needs an epistemic reorientation through which we interrogate the place of Africa in theory building. According to Mbembe, this epistemic reorientation should necessarily shake, I quote, the Western centric tendency to interpret the world and its social, economic, um, political, and cultural processes from a Euro American perspective, end of quote. To imagine this possibility, we need to see that elsewhere beyond providing empirical materials. This entails seeing the world, again, um, to quote Mbembe, as a vast network of affinities. Seeing the world as a vast network of affinities makes the work of theorizing the world from Africa or writing Africa into the world as one of its fragments um, an accelerating ta task. Now, African modes of self-writing then become an exercise in theorizing these affinities, entanglements, and relationships, old and newly emerging ones, in which Africa is implicated. This exercise in decentering Euro-American notions also means acknowledging and theorizing the significance of Africa's emergent and or already existing affinities with other geographies and histories. Now, based on this, uh, I propose to reassess the relationship between African studies and the study of sexualities in a way that interrupts Western canons. This can be done by imagining other conditions of possibilities for the intersection of African studies and sexuality as an epistemic category. Magdashi and Poir succinctly capture these possibilities when they write, I quote, the relationship of area studies to sexuality is multiple, invigorating, and potentially groundbreaking, but only to the extent that both fields allow the archive theoretical presumptions, key terms, and areas of inquiry to suffuse, confuse, and destabilize each other. End of quote. Theorizing the interplay of diverse knowledges, experiences, histories is crucial to problematize these seem seemingly irreconcilable binaries. Beyond the homo hetero binary, for example, and its attendant discourse of a homophobic Africa, we need to delve into histories to see what other ways of understanding and living sexual desire exist and what new experiences and subjectivities emerge. Now, before I close the talk, let me share an example that Joseph Massad once spoke of when asked about Islam and sexuality. Brushing aside the simplistic assumption that Islam is intolerant towards same-sex desires, he commented that we need to ask, I quote, how Islam was produced by discourses in sexuality among activists and academics. I would like to close by adopting the question to ask what discourses of sexuality have done to the way we know Africa and what can change by raising different questions such as the ones I started with in this talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for a really engaging um, conversation and, and intervention. I feel very energized by what you've shared with us. Um, and I'm just going to uh, share and pose a few questions that you might want to talk more about. Uh, that just really, I'm just very inspired by what you've shared with us today. Um, you talked a lot about how uh, it, the project that you're working on now mo uh, locates multiple revolutions and intersectionality in ways that are really important and I think that in many ways you do intervene into debates um, in transnational and African studies um, that are important for those of us working on sexuality and queerness and also for policy and NGOs uh, that challenge a lot of long-held assumptions, both assumptions um, by those to, who seek to discriminate 
uh, and also assumptions by um, scholars who have made a lot of generalizations based on both their location in the global north or the um, dominance of particular locations in, in Africa, right, in kind of a lot of common discourse. Um, some examples of these that I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about would be um, the imposition of language, right, like language categories around queerness. I know in some of your writing you talk about Ethiopian ways of reclaiming language in ways that are specifically grounded in citizenship and belonging. Um, another kind of debate that I see you really intervening in is around um, histories of same-sex desire and homophobia, right, like what are these kinds of origin stories that we've been told and also that have dominated in um, uh, in kind of conversations that originate in the global north uh, of folks who are queer themselves, right? How can we re-theorize um, sexuality and queerness from anywhere, you know, as you say, using Mbembe uh, and, and what would be some ways that we can kind of shake up some of those Western or Northern centric tendencies through the ethnic ethnographic work that you're doing now. And then the last debate I was thinking about that you really intervene in is around um, identity categories versus behavior and how legalities tend to kind of codify identity in a certain way. Um, but at the same time, there's ways that activists who you're working with are really reclaiming identity in interesting ways and using that to their advantage. So I'm just wondering if any of those kind of speak to you, if you'd help us think about ways to recenter Africa and specifically recentering um, the three locations that you're working in, um, in, in both uh, examples of the challenges that are being posed to these long held assumptions, as well as strategies for social change um, that we might think about in, in kind of countering marginalization and, and violence that folks are facing. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you and then to Leela, but thank you so much. Um, for this really exciting conversation. Um, okay, yeah, um, thanks Amanda for, uh, for the reflections um, and thoughtful engagement. Uh, uh, I think some of the questions you raised are uh, questions I've been thinking about, some others for me to continue to you know, ponder as I go on with my, with my project. Um, um, so I think in, in what I could say, or what I would like to say now, um, is the like the dilemma of rejecting categories altogether and start thinking anew about about uh, new categories that draw on um, local languages. For example, one of the categories that I work with um, is a category of Zega. Um, Zega um, um, is a highly historically grounded word and it's it's i mean i'm, I'm not talking talking about uh, queerness in, in in the ethiopian context and how much people use um important categories uh, such as gay um uh, lesbian or how how or rather how, how much of them also prefer to kind of locally ground their queerness and um adopt um words like zega so zega is Literally, it's a, it's a word that refers to citizenship. In the, in the, it's a legal identity in the constitution by, by which all of us are referred to. But then the, the queer community in Ethiopia adopted the word um, to, as, as, a, you know, as a code word to um, uh, refer to one another. And then it was really exciting for me to, to discover that word and start thinking about it. And like um, the dilemma was then, what is the use of um, gay, for example, when we can actually develop Zega and make it into, um, um, like theorize um, uh, Zega on the, on the basis of local history experiences and struggles instead of just borrowing uh, um, gay, which doesn't necessarily uh, capture the complexity of experiences um, that are, um, that are um, um, you know, embedded in, 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 in Ethiopia or in, in, in the whole region. Um, so what do we do and uh, so what do we do with these categories that are borrowed? Do we completely reject them or do we re-appropriate um, them, redefine them and translate them into local contexts without necessarily rejecting them? So, but it's like a continuous uh, process of thinking about these things and I don't think there's like a, a 
an answer one could give. Um, but if if I must, I'd like uh, I'd like to think about theorizing um, Zega um, and then see where there are um, where, where there are par parallels. For, for example, with other categories developed in Tunisia or um, in, in Sudan or elsewhere in the Middle East or in Asia, um, instead of just thinking about this um, notion of sexuality in categories that are um, always, you know, um, 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 uh, that are always drawing on the, exp on, on the experience of people in the, in the, in the West or histories in the West. So, I don't, I don't know, I'm, I'm not really answering your question. I think it's more like, we'll just continue thinking about this and um, yeah, we'll grapple. Um, uh, yeah. Would you like um, to add some more of Sarah Witt's, um, uh, sorry, Amanda's questions, um, or sh maybe we can get some audience um, questions in as well. Um, so that we can have more of a, um, um, uh, conversation. Um, so we have one question already asking um, about how you use the archive and ethnography together because you're you're you have such a very create you have, so you have such a creative talk in which you're making us rethink theory. You're making us rethink what how we define Africa, and then you have a, a really interesting discussion of methods. So uh, we have one um, colleague who wants to know about specifically about archive and ethnography, and how you combine those. Um. So I think, in a sense, uh, what I'm doing is a history of the present. Um, um, so, um, so one of the things um, in doing history of the present is um, finding a way to put uh, in conversation what are contemporary lived experiences and on the basis of what shapes those experiences. Um, um, and then um, you try to understand what went on um, uh, you know, to kind of shape whatever is going on now. So like in a, in a, in a piece I, I wrote a while back, one of the things I do is bring together archival materials and ethnographic materials, think about the lived experiences um, and, and histories of queer people in today's Ethiopia. And so for example, one of the, one of the things I did was um, like juxtaposing um, Two, two versions of history or two readings of Ethiopian history where one document or one, one old document um, um, penalizes um, um, sexual practices among same-sex same, same sex people and another one um, using the same, basically the, the same uh, document, another one then um, uh, opens up the possibility for the existence of um, uh, same-sex desires and um, living together under one roof as 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 couple. And so, if uh, if the way we understand history chooses to privilege um, the heteronormative uh, um, uh, approach to uh, to you know history and politics, then we disregard um, uh, those other stories. So this the ethnographic. Um, <coughs> contemporary moment um, in, in, the, in the experience of queer Ethiopians forces us to ask questions of um, what history looked like and what, what other histories were buried down by hegemonic discourses that privilege heteronormativity as the rule. So um, I kind of brought together those um, tensions to read the document from a perspective of um, what lived experiences exist today, what kind of violence queer people um, um, are exposed to in today's Ethiopia and why is that? What does history teach us about these um, this, um, conditions? And how do pe pe queer people, my queer interlocutors and friends think about um, their history? Because there's a struggle to identify with Ethiopia, but the Ethiopia that they try to identify with imposes itself in a different way, in, in a way that doesn't accommodate them. So there's always the search um, for an Ethiopia that would um, accommodate them in, in, on their own terms. And that goes to looking at um, our history, the history that has been neglected, deliberately neglected. So I try to bring this together and put them in conversation and try to understand contemporary experiences and thereby I claim I kind of do a history of the present. 
And so it sounds like it's almost another kind of rupture which, which you're trying to create through your method. Um, uh, it, it's really interesting. So just picking up on your discussion of Ethiopia, we have a question um, from someone who's asking whether, um, and this may be also linked to your discussion of um, the complexity of experience. Um, in what way do queer activists see their struggles as relating or not relating to struggles over federalism that have been so much in the news in recent years, or maybe even other kinds of protest movements? So are there intersections between um, queer activism and other forms of political movements or protests in the country? Um, there are intersections. Um, um, so, the, you know, the way in which, especially uh, after the change of, um, after the change in, in 1991, the way in, in which it, the Ethiopian polit political community is organized is only around ethnicity and there's no way, uh, there, there's no room for other ways of being and um, politically organizing. So one of the, one of the things uh, queer activists, especially those uh, who are based in the diaspora do is um, accept themselves um, um, as Ethiopians, as proud Ethiopians as, as that, but not necessarily defined by the ethnic identity or uh, not by, um, you know, their class identity or anything, but um, a, a political community that uh, is organized around, um, because it has become an identity category, one cannot deny that. And that identity category is not a political, it's, it's highly politicized and it's highly historically grounded and therefore ground themselves and they, they assert themselves in, 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 in that way. And there's always this tension um, um, where, you know, um, some of uh, the human rights, even human rights activists, uh, so-called so progressive and liberal human rights activists, activists say, oh, um, you know, uh, issues of uh, homosexuals are not a priority. Now we are struggling with this um, highly discriminated ethnic, well, for the rights of this highly discriminated ethnic group or for the rights of this group, for the rights of, so, you know, you can postpone your questions. You can postpone, so it's never really regarded as a political question uh, in and of itself. Um, and so the continuous struggle queer people wage is to assert themselves as political, um, subjects um, who have a say and who matter in the history, in the political history of the country. Um, so it, it's always in constant tension and perhaps also an alternative to the way in which um, ethnic politics is organized in the country. So it's almost like you're saying the intersection poses dangers of constantly having to defer to other struggles. I think that's really interesting. Um, so we have another question, um, maybe a different angle on that, which is, thinking about um, some of the um, discriminatory laws and practices, maybe in Ethiopia or maybe some of the other contexts you're talking about, um, the person wants to know about the legacies of colonization um, on like legal structures or some of the challenges which queer activists face. Um, the colonial legacy. Yeah, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm thinking, for example, I, my work is on India and I'm thinking that in India, one of the, the most, um, the, the, the laws which prohibit, which um, um, made um, gay and lesbian uh, desire illegal was actually a British colonial law. And so that was then adopted by the, the independent Indian government. I think that person's asking if there's a similar kind of parallel. Yeah, there is and there isn't. So, um, uh, so if we look at one of the old documents, um, uh, it's called Tahanagas. Um, it's a document from the 13th, 14th century, and it has been, used how, how has it been used how, how popular was it is another question but it has been used around at least in the in the, you know, in the palace um, so this this document has two um, two sections it's a, it's a legal document and uh, you know legal historians Ethiopian legal historians argue it's one of the foundations of Ethiopian law Ethiopian contemporary law so it has two sections the first one deals with you know the 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 otherworldly, the transcendent, and the other one, the second one deals with um, the, you know, the mundane, the everyday. In the everyday, what we see is, um, so uh, sexual practices are, um, sexual practices between two, between men mostly, are um, condemned, mm -hmm. uh, and there's a punishment for that. And also um, offers um, you know, rules um, as to who is legitimate to have sex and who cannot have sex on the basis of what and everything. So there is 
um, there is this legislation laid out on that, in that document. But what we see there is um, it's always the practice that's condemned. It has never been an identity. It's, it wasn't a category of identity. So where we see that you know the the colonial legacy is then when we actually come to contemporary penal codes in Ethiopia. So for example, in 1957 we had. No, sorry, in 1957 it was revised, but in the 30s we had the first penal code. And there, uh, uh, there uh, you know, um, that penal code draws largely on this old document, but it also ran, largely draws on um, Western codes, right? So what happens there is instead of condemning and punishing or penalizing the practice, it gets, um, uh, it gets inserted there or as, a, as an identity category. So one person becomes a criminal for indulging same-sex practices. And so there is where we see the, you know, the insertion of the colonial legacy, um, at least in a more profound way. I wouldn't say like for the first time or anything, but more profoundly and in a more elaborate way, you see the colonial um, legislations operating um, in kind of defining um, uh, sexual practices as forms of identities. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, so, uh, uh, so a few more questions. I think people found your talk very engaging. So there's a couple of questions um, where I think people just want to hear you talk more because they're, they're, um, they're express I'm going to combine some of these. They're, they're expressing the reaction that this idea of using Zega, Zega, Zega for official purposes or legal documents um, and then reappropriating this really, they're finding kind of a fascinating idea. They want to hear more about it. And they want to, um, one person is also asking, is this a way of saying that everybody's queer or is it appropriating a word for queer activists? Like they just, I think if you could just flesh that out, I think that's, uh, it's sparking some interest from our audience. Okay, so um, um, it's really fascinating that, so I, I was, uh, uh, so Zeg, like I said, Zeg is a, yeah, it's a legal identity and a constitutionally um, endorsed legal identity. So I am Zega, everybody else is Zega and ev ev everything. So that's one notion of Zega. But Zega has another history also to it um, that um, goes back to the 18th century where um, it refers to um, um, landless tenants that worked under the clergy in the Ethiopian context, especially in the Northern Ethiopian context. So Zega in that context has been something or a category of people who have been on the margins of power, privilege, and access to you know, land. And then in, in, in more recent times, um, earlier, around two, early 2000, um, um, queer Abyssalians had to find a way to, to, to get together. Um, so they created this online platform, Ayahu Group, uh, um, and then they had to come up, for, at least from my conversations so far, nobody really thought of the history of Zega, of it being on the margins of power. It's just um, more like, um, uh, it's, uh, I can call myself Zega and nobody really would suspect anything. Um, so, so it became this code word and people use it to refer to each other. And nobody really frowns up on you if you say um, Zega on the streets and because it's, it's, it's a safe word for some years. But of late, um, um, people, or at, at least uh, some, even some activists who, activists against queer people, have now uh, come to understand um, Zega has been appropriated by the queer community as a code word. Um, as a result of which people are now a bit, I mean, queer people are now a bit skeptical. They don't really um, go about the street and, um, you know, use a code word because that could also mean a recipe for being attacked or being targeted or anything. So now suddenly Zika became that word of safety has now become a site of insecurity for most people in Addis at least. So people are now a, a bit reserved from, from, from using it for what it instigates because uh, the word just happened to be a bit more popular by, especially by detractors and people um, who do some kind of activism against queer bodies in, in, in the country. So it has all these fluid and interesting um, histories and yet it comes across as a very simple everyday um, 
use others also use it to refer to foreigners actually yeah. to just say yeah i mean if you see someone from elsewhere one could just refer to them as sega or could ask them if they are one so yeah hmm, that's so interesting and so it's it's uh, it's it's one word but it, it's it's almost it was almost kind of like an invisible ap appropriation that then got reappropriated it's yeah what you're saying that's really interesting so um a couple of more questions again this is going to take you in a different direction because people have seen so much um, richness in your talk uh Sarawit. so um a couple of people are asking about your you know your um some of it is about your own migration yeah because you're you're diff you're actually working in different audiences and different um geographical um national locations and um uh, and some people are also asking about the um uh, how how um, how queer politics in the diaspora relate to queer politics in home countries? So um, both in terms of um, maybe like your your location and theorizing, and then sort of more broadly in terms of the movement. So those are huge questions. So just take any little piece of it because um, uh, there's a lot that I'm sure that you could say about about all of it. So just whichever part of it you want to mm -hmm. talk about. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, I'd like to think of myself as an expert. Um, because uh, why not? <laughs> uh, so I, um, but I, I should acknowledge the privileged um, uh, position I have, um, um, and I'm trying to use my privilege of safety of all sorts of uh, everything that comes with my with my being located in in, in the West in Germany, um, and I try to use that uh, to do um, something. Um, um, at least, uh, you know, by sharing some of the, the, the skills I have and by having conversations and um, by having conversations, not only with my, you know, intellectual interlo interlocutors, but a couple of my friends are already here listening to this and we have a really um, um, a strong uh, connection, bond and uh, conversations and debates. So uh, there is that and I believe um, we are doing something through those conversations together. Um, but when it comes to the, the this or connect this slash connect between uh, activism, local activism, and um, 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 activism that's based in the diaspora, um, um, so I so there aren't always arguments between between both both groups. So in terms of what should be, you know, emphasized at a moment in time, and how it should be approached. For example, from the point of view of safety of those located back home, um, and what does it mean to 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 do activism or advocacy um, from a place of safety? That's Europe and America. Um, uh, how, what is its implication on people back home? For example, how does it expose them? And all that there is this tension all the time, and I think. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a part of some of the conversation, but most mostly conversations are being had amongst the group um, because the attempt is for, uh, for uh, like those who are in, in safe spaces trying to be um, a voice. For example, one of the debates is access to health facilities and um, uh, locally based um, queer folks uh, cannot be as vocal as um, my friends in the diaspora can be. And there's that and um, so um, there's a whole lot of complementing one another and trying to work together, but that's, I, I will not say it's not without its own um, challenges and, and tensions, but I think uh, uh, um, I, I wouldn't want to speak uh, on behalf of um, um, my, my friends who are immersed in the conversation. I think I'd, this much would be what I'd like to say. Okay. And so it seems that some of the tensions of um, who theorizes may play out a little bit in the diaspora as well because of the issues of safety and the power differentials. Is that what, kind of what you're saying? Um, 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 that could also fa factor in, but um, in, in, in terms of, but that's not really very strong in its presence. Um, I think it's more like in, in, in activism in the practical life of in the in the practical everyday life of queer people and like what what they need what should be done 
um, in, in, in all that. Um, but that's already very political and grounded on, on knowledge and theorization. So yes, uh, theorization and the knowledge base is not divorced from, but it's importantly something that informs whatever is going on in the realm of activism. Um, but who can theorize and who uh, can't um, makes part of the debate, but not really strongly, at least to my knowledge, there might be some that I'm not aware of. Thank you. Um, there's another question, uh, maybe a little bit of a different um, angle, which is really trying to um, just asking you about more about cultural narratives um, in any of the parts uh, uh, um, of Africa that you're studying, and how do how do these cultural narratives um, shape perceptions and define sexual desires, sexual practices? Can you read that again? Sorry. Yeah, it's. I, I think so. I think the question is the question is phrased about the definition of the human condition amongst these cultures, at least among the major cultural narratives in those areas of Africa you're interested in. How do they see and define the sexual desire and act? And I think I'm interpreting it as, as kind of a cultural context or cultural narratives. So does that how does that shape um, the activism, the societal perceptions? Again, it's a very broad question. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a very broad question and um, also perhaps a little early uh, to, to answer at this stage because uh, the project is uh, still at, at, at its um, in, inception. Maybe if I get the opportunity again to do the same thing in a, you know, in a, in a couple of years, I'd be able to answer this um, more effectively. But that doesn't mean I can't speak to this or at least from, you know, um, um, from experiences and how sexual desire is understood in 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 in, in Ethiopia, and I think the typical um, one, like the one, the, the in in a world, it's heteronormative um, uh, understanding that shapes everything. The discourse and the practice and the prudeness uh, um, is other um, the other um, qualifier I would use and. Uh, this gets into the political, the social, and the cultural life of the, the collective, and the, it goes out of the the, the house to, from the private to to shape um, public discourses and um, understandings. And um, so, the way people think about um, queer bodies and um, identities is very much shaped by that, um, and it's believed to be uh, excessive. To be queer, it's a luxury, and you know, you're just experimenting with these Western things of um, whatever you know you just receive and don't ask questions. And um, most people consider it as lifestyle and something experimental, and that's also partly shaped by how society understands sex and sexual desire in a rather you know simplistic way. And I think that connects to what you were saying earlier when you were talking about um, uh, sexuality not being viewed as political and something that can wait after some of the real issues of movement. So it's kind of circling back. We can yeah. always yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so there is there's also a lot of interest just in terms of your methods as a researcher, because you have such a rich understanding of um, and uh, it, uh, connection to the um, queer activists, it seems that you're, you're talking about. And there's one question which is ask, just asking basically as a researcher, how did you build a trust and how did you navigate um, uh, you know, these different affinities which you're talking about? Um, I think my, uh, my very presence um, as, a, as a person that I am is queer and um, um, um and okay so one of the things that i count on that have uh, helped me is my experience as a as a teacher um, as a teacher in both high school and um and college and um i think i have so the vocabulary to relate to to um various um sections of people and um and um, and the, the way I carry myself is not uh, 
I'm not the most conventional Ethiopian and it's easy to identify or relate to me. I think, well, at least that's what, what, what I have um, uh, every time I relate to, to queer people in, in Ethiopia. Thank you. And so, you know, you were just mentioning teaching and one of the questions is actually asking about teaching. So do you, have you, um, have you been, have you got, had a chance to teach about these issues and how do students respond? And is there a difference between responses from heritage students, you know, diasporic students, um, European um, West slash Western, Europe, you know, Western students? Um, okay, so I haven't really taught the subject in Ethiopia. Um, so I wouldn't know how it will be received there, although I have my assumptions. Uh, I've, I've done some seminars uh, here in Germany, a couple of places in Germany, and I have done a one-week workshop in, in Tunisia uh, where, yeah, this project was inspired by those conversations I had with, with, with people in Tunisia and in, in, in Germany. Um, and yeah, I think people people are uh, excited and want to know more, want to ask more questions. Um, and at times, there are strange assumptions about Africa and about the you know the you know the topic of sexuality being mm -hmm. an issue in, in in Africa, but like in a more like com com complex way to say, uh, okay, so, uh, you know, we can't always talk about homophobia when we talk about Africa in, in, in relation to sexuality. There are, you know, there are ways in which we have to ask other questions. Um, and so these sometimes have, uh, you know, strange receptions from some of my seminar participants, but uh, since teaching is an ongoing process, so there's always, um, you know, a way with, uh, uh, with more readings and with more conversations, um, yeah, sometimes it can get a bit strange and yeah. funny, <laughs> but yeah. If I can just tie this back to something you, you said in your, in your talk, which is you were talking about um, um, sort of rethinking area studies and not thinking of Africa just as a kind of raw material for informants. Um, but I'm wondering if there's another twist to it. Um, do you find that if, like in, in these seminars, for example, if people do not know anything about the context, is, you know, because in some ways there's an area of studies which has to be kind of disentangled or, or you know, un, uh, um, taken apart, but then there's also audiences if they don't have any kind of context or any kind of knowledge, there isn't even a knowledge base to unpack. And I'm just wondering if, if you had thought through that or experienced that as well. Um, no, luckily I haven't, um, so because the seminars I, Oh no, I had um, so the first time I went to Tunisia, I went um, I went uh, in a context. It's actually an, an interesting anecdote because I went in a context of um, the launching of an African studies school in in Tunisia, and so there I had to give a, a presentation. So the, so um, the participants were very excited to come to um, to Africa and study its people. And that didn't sit well with, with me and with the way I think. So, um, so they were asking questions like, okay, so if, if we go to Africa and study languages, the, the typical colonial anthropological questions were being raised and how they could approach those questions by going to Africa from, from Tunisia. And that was quite an informative experience for me. Partly it resonated uh, to to what I know about Ethiopia and Ethiopian exceptionalism and the way we think about ourselves in relation to the rest of Africa. Um, but there I was also the the African, um, so it was a aha, a aha moment for me um, to have been confronted with that kind of um, experience where people just got excited to go to Africa to study the exotic people, the other and you know, they are still there and they are, the, the, the Evans Richard kind of research was what most of them had in mind um, when they, you know, when the African Studies School opened and it was, it was quite an experience and, but uh, very helpful one also because it 
kind of is uh, behind what made me think about Tunisia and in, in incorporating Tunisia in the project now. That's really yeah. interesting. And kind of building on that, there's a question um, from one of our colleagues who's asking, kind of building on the area studies discussion, um, um, asking to you to talk more about how the idea of thinking about the global through affinities rather than nation states help us reimagine area studies, because you were talking about that uh, earlier in your talk. So maybe if you could just, I think one if he wants to hear more about that um, theoretical approach you were discussing. Yeah, I haven't really. Um, so yeah, that is um, so something that Mbembe is in, in his African modes of um, self-writing, I forgot the title now. Um, and so he, he says we should, look, we should start looking at the world at, as, a, as a network of affinities. Um, and then I think we will get to cross um, certain boundaries that are laid out by power, by capital, and by um, historical relations of colonialism and everything. And we can start imagining um, uh, relating um, differently, um, on, also on, di on different levels. And I think it also helps us um, to decenter the, the West and Europe as a center of everything and start thinking about relationships, say, for example, within, within the continent um, and with, with, with Asia and with, with the Caribbean and with, with um, Latin America and, 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 and all that. So this, this um, notion of affinities, at least for me, that's how I, 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 I see it. Um, it kind of opens up possibilities for different kinds of relationships and theorizing those relationships and, um, and um, histories. Um, so we can leave behind um, the obsession with, with the West um, as a point of theorizing or the point um, uh, of speaking back to, so conversations can be had with um, um, interlocutors everywhere and um yeah that's how i think about it and perhaps the idea of area studies in general can also be um something we can do away with altogether because of i mean the, the very history of area studies is as problematic and very politically charged it's for the interest of politics and power and capital so maybe it's not even useful after all Thank you for that. And uh, so we have time for one more question. And one of our colleagues would like to know um, what you're working on next, what kinds of research questions, um, and you know, where, where do you see yourself going next after this project? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, this is uh, so. This is I just marked on this, and it's going to go on for uh, for the next four years. Hopefully, a book will come out of this, plus uh, you know the PhD dissertations. Um, and um, uh, more questions, um, perhaps broadening my my like geographical re reach. I don't know. I don't want to be ambitious and say I want to do this after this, and then I don't want to be laid down later when I can't achieve all of this. So I'd rather just stay uh, here and um, focus on this. And but this this the the, the presentation I did today is at the heart of what I'm about um, to do for the next four years and yeah. where this leads to, um, we shall see. Yeah, and your, your work is so rich and complex. You, you already have your hands full, I think. So, um, so Sarah, I would love to, I'd just like to thank you for such a wonderful presentation and for being patiently um, answering um, such complicated and, and huge questions in many ways. Um, it's been really wonderful to have you um, it, it virtually, if not, you know, actually in in yeah. person. And I hope we get uh, I hope we get a chance to continue these discussions in in other ways. Um, thank you, everyone in the audience as well. So I think um, we'll end the seminar right now. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It was sure, a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience.